Bonsoir, je suis ravie d'avoir été invitée à vous parler et je vous prie d'avoir un peu de complaisance avec mon français. C'est la première fois que j'ai présent en français depuis longtemps. J'ai étudié le français à l'université et je suis devenue programmeuse un peu bah, par hasard. Donc, avoir l'opportunité d'utiliser cette langue 30 années plus tard est en même temps terrifiant <rire> et merveilleux. Et en effet, ça correspond un peu à une ou des thèmes de ma présentation. La préservation de connaissances et la réutilisation des outils. Je dois remercier Thibault à, à la fois pour m'avoir invité et pour avoir corrigé mon français. <rire> Donc, euh, évidemment, pour Thibault, je commence avec une mime. <rire> qu'est-ce qu'on fait ici? Qu'est-ce qu'on fait ici? Je veux dire, qu'est-ce que nous faisons lorsque nous faisons du développement applicatif dans les humanités numériques? Je pense que nous devons commencer par examiner les buts de ce développement parce qu'il me semble que quelquefois, les vrais buts sont un peu oubliés. Il est facile d'être séduit par l'acte développé, par le code lui-même. Mais on doit toujours penser au numérique comme utile pour atteindre la connaissance. Nous utilisons les méthodes numériques parce qu'elles nous donnent la capacité d'examiner les textes, les images, les artefacts culturels avec plus de précision, de les exposer à un nouveau public, de les joindre de nouvelles façons, de croiser les domaines, d'enseigner plus efficacement. Ça ne veut pas dire que faire du développement n'est-ce pas un bon but soi-même, mais ça ne peut être, pas être le seul but. Je pense qu'il faut toujours être conscient de ce fait. Donc, il faut conserver ce qu'on fait. Si nous parlons de connaissances, nous devons parler aussi d'évaluation. Pour être évalué, tout ce que nous produisons doit être reproductible. Donc, si les logiciels nous aident à produire des connaissances, des logiciels devient une partie du dossier de recherche. Il fut une époque, j'imagine, les notes qu'on prenait dans la recherche étaient la première façon de garder une trace, une archive de cette recherche. Nous ne jetons pas nos notes, donc nous ne jetons pas nos, nos logiciels. Il faut les conserver. Mais conserver les logiciels exige vraiment une certaine prévoyance. Si nous n'en prenons pas conscience dès le départ, cela va être beaucoup plus difficile de le faire plus tard. Et si nous voulons créer quelque chose qui peut durer, et bien sûr, il y a aussi des choses qui ne doivent pas durer, nous devons faire attention aux choix que nous faisons sur la route. Lorsqu'on pense à conserver, on peut garder en tête ces questions. Pourquoi? Quand? Quoi? Pour combien de temps? Qui est responsable? Et comment le faire? Donc, avant de commencer à développer, nous devons considérer quelques, quelques <coughs> autres questions. D'abord, est-il nécessaire de tout créer? Est-ce que les logiciels dont nous avons besoin existent déjà? Sinon, existe-t-il quelque chose à laquelle on peut ajouter ce besoin particulier? Mais comment savoir s'il sera possible d'ajouter? Et s'il est possible, est-il encore une bonne idée? Je vais prendre quelques minutes pour discuter un peu cette dernière question. Réutiliser en ajoutant de nouvelles fonctionnalités au logiciel est quelque chose que je connais beaucoup. La plus grande partie de Perseids, l'infrastructure sur laquelle j'ai travaillé les derniers 4 ou 5 ans, pour Tufts, réutilise et se, et se construit sur des logiciels qui existent déjà. On a fait des bons et aussi des moins bons choix pendant le cours du projet. Un des bons choix était le choix de cœur de la plateforme Soso, ou Son of Sud Online. C'est un produit qui vient d'un autre projet, Papyri.info. Lorsque je l'ai évalué, j'ai considéré ces questions. A-t-il des fonctionnalités dont j'ai besoin? Si des choses lui manquent, sert-il simple ou difficile de les ajouter? A-t-il des tests unitaires? Est-ce que l'architecture du code est fa favorable à l'extension? Une nécessité <rire> une, une, une distorsion? A-t-il de la bonne documentation? Est-il soutenu? En ce cas, sauf pour la documentation, je pouvais dire oui. Donc, j'ai fait des expériences. 
Je pense que c'est nécessaire pour évaluer. Il faut toucher le code. Mais il est vrai que ça prend du temps et il peut être difficile de savoir quand on doit arrêter si on ne marche pas bien. Le choix a provoqué aussi des coûts. Plus j'avais touché le code, plus difficile était d'être sûr que je ne casse pas quelque chose et de préserver l'architecture. Il y avait des choses dans le code dont nous n'avons pas besoin et de temps en temps cela exigeait des décisions loin d'être parfaites. Si j'avais eu du temps et un budget sans limite, peut-être j'aurais fait un autre choix. Mais sous ces circonstances, je pense que ce choix nous a permis de réussir, réussir sur Perseids. Même si le choix de réutiliser quelque chose n'est pas un succès, le processus peut enseigner quelque chose et aider à former l'architecture de ce qu'on fera au final. Avec Perseid, nous avons essayé de réutiliser Hypothesis, un outil pour l'annotation des pages du web pour faire des annotations des réseaux sociaux. On l'a choisi parce qu'il offre la capacité d'annoter n'importe quelle page avec n'importe quel texte et qu'il offre aussi une API pour extraire, extraire facilement les annotations comme données. Tout ça correspondait à ce que nous pensions avoir besoin. Mais au moment où les étudiants l'ont utilisé, utilisé, nous avons trouvé qu'il manquait quelques fonctionnalités qui étaient essentielles. En ce cas, c'était la capacité de voir la direction des relations dans le réseau lorsqu'ils les annotaient et de valider l'ontologie des relations ainsi données. Découvrir ces choses nous a aidé à faire le plan de Plokomos, l'outil que nous avons éventuellement construit pour cette tâche. Donc, mon avis dans ce cas est que si vous trouvez un outil que vous pensez peut-être réutiliser et que vous avez un peu de temps pour expérimenter, cela vaut la peine, même si à la fin vous décidez de créer quelque chose d'autre. Vous allez apprendre beaucoup simplement dans l'acte de lire le code et de l'utiliser pour les choses pour lesquelles n'était pas écrit. Et n'ayez pas peur de changer d'avis si ça prend trop de temps. Je pense qu'en ce moment, beaucoup des lo de logiciels qu'on écrit dans les humanités numériques ne seront jamais réutilisés. C'est pour des raisons diverses et nombreuses, mais j'aimerais bien voir un changement de culture sur ce point. Donc, je vous encourage fortement à essayer. Plus les développeurs le font, plus le code de la communauté devient ré réutilisable. Donc, OK, nous avons maintenant décidé de développer quelque chose, soit à partir de rien, soit en réutilisant ensemble d'utiles. Pour établir un plan dès le départ, nous devons nous demander quelques questions. Que sont les produits les plus importants dans mes objectifs? Ce sont les données. Si oui, <coughs> quels outils je vais, que je vais créer vont contribuer à produire ou modifier les données? Si sont pour présenter ou publier les données, est-ce que leur représentation est essentielle à leur compréhension? Est-ce que leur visualisation est essentielle à l'argument derrière vos données? Ces questions sont importantes pour décider, par exemple, s'il est nécessaire que les outils puissent être reconstruits et réexécutés, ou s'il est suffisant de conserver des images des représentations. Est-ce que le service ou l'outil lui-même qui représente le progrès créé par le projet, les algorithmes, l'architecture, le processus de développement, l'expérience des utilisateurs, quels sont les aspects du logiciel sans lesquels il est impossible de reproduire les résultats de recherche? Pour qui je les développe? Qui sont les utilisateurs? C'est moi-même, quelques chercheurs, les étudiants, le public. En tout cas, même si on développe pour soi-même, on doit suivre les bonnes pratiques et préparer la préservation du logiciel. Mais plus il y a de l'utilisateur, plus il y aura de responsabilité pour ces choses. C'est, à mon avis, un des plus grands défis de développer dans le monde académique. Les systèmes de récompense suivant exigent qu'on essaie de convaincre les autres que ce qu'on crée a du mérite et vaut la peine de l'utiliser. Mais les systèmes de financement suivant ne comptent pas soutenir cet usage pour le long temps. Les développeurs se trouvent dans une place difficile. 
C'est à cause de ce, ce fait qu'il est important de faire attention aux bonnes pratiques dès le départ. Si votre code n'est compréhensible que pour vous, mais que vous encouragez les autres à l'utiliser, si vous ne pouvez pas encore le soutenir, vous laissez vos, vos utilisateurs sans option. Cette responsabilité reste aussi avec les utilisateurs, utilisateurs bien sûr, de faire attention lorsqu'ils décident d'utiliser le logiciel. Mais souvent, ces choses ne sont pas discutées en avance. Pour moi, lorsque je me trouvais dans cette situation et que j'avais quelqu'un me, me disant que leur recherche était bloquée à cause du fait que je ne peux pas continuer à développer l'outil que j'ai fait pour cela, c'était à la fois une vraie prise de conscience et une sonnette d'alarme. Donc, ça nous mène à, au dernier point sur ce sujet. Pour combien de temps doit-il rester disponible? Simplement, à la fin du projet de recherche, est-ce qu'on va citer le logiciel dans les publica publications? On va citer les données? Voulez-vous le soutenir et le maintenir dans l'avenir? Voulez-vous que les autres contribuent au développement? Les réponses à toutes ces questions doivent influencer les choix que nous faisons pour conceptualiser et écrire les logiciels. Évidemment, il faut utiliser les systèmes ouverts comme GitHub pour contrôler des versions de code, mais les utiliser bien, faites des commits très suivants, n'attendez pas jusqu'au fin du développement. Si vous créez des données avec les outils, gardez l'information sur la version ou commit de code que vous avez utilisé pour les créer. Il y, avait, il y avait des normes comme Bravo pour enregistrer ces choses. Si vous écrivez les logiciels, vous pouvez penser à créer automatiquement des dossiers avec ces normes. Si vous voulez citer vos logiciels et vous les gardez sur GitHub, vous pouvez enregistrer pour un DOI pour Zenodo. Un DOI est un identifiant persistant. Vous pouvez utiliser un outil comme Open Science Framework qui peut aussi être intégré avec GitHub et d'autres services et vous offre la capacité d'archiver vos données, entre autres. Je vais en dire plus sur les bonnes pratiques un peu plus tard. Donc, les choix, quelques choix importants ou pourquoi être branché n'est pas toujours bon. Nous faisons toujours beaucoup de choix pour conceptualiser et écrire nos logiciels. Mais voici quelqu'un des plus importants. Le langage de programmation. Quelques questions à se demander. Est-il bien soutenu? A-t-il des fonctions, fonctions nécessaires? Est-il difficile à apprendre ou utiliser? Il y a beaucoup de librairies pour en profiter. Pour les frameworks et librairies, sous quelle licence est-il offert? Est-il bien soutenu? Regardez-vous sur les listes des bugs, l'histoire du commit, tout ça pour être sûr. A-t-il les fonctions nécessaires? Ajoute-t-il vraiment du valeur? Est-il possible de l'utiliser sans en être dépendant? <coughs> Je vais dire plus sur le sujet du framework dans quelques instants. Pour les données liées, quelle licence? A-t-il les identifiants persistants? Sont-elles versionnées? Utilisent-elles une norme? Qui les fournit? Un projet individu, une université, une bibliothèque? <coughs> Quelles sont les politiques de soutenance et disponibilité? Pour les services externalisés, il y a des questions similaires. Quelle licence? Est-ce que l'API est stable, versionné? Qui le fournit? Quelles sont les politiques de maintien, maintien, maintien et disponibilité? Et pour l'environnement de déploiement, Utiliser un service libre, un service offert par l'université. Qui va le maintenir? Est-ce qu'il y a un coût pour le long terme? Qui va payer? Est-il sauvegardé? Est-il surveillé? Il y a beaucoup de plus à dire sur tous ces sujets, mais pour le moment, je voudrais vous donner un exemple au sujet du framework. <coughs> Évidemment, <rire> pas, pas la photo. Un de mes plus grands regrets était le choix que nous avons fait d'utiliser le framework euh, AngularJS pour Arethusa, un outil pour faire des annotations grammaticales en arbre de la syntaxe. Ce framework a offert beaucoup d'avantages et au moment où nous avons décidé de l'essayer, il semblait être un bon choix. 
la philosophie de l'architecture qu'il imposait faisait sens. Beaucoup de, de projets commerciaux l'utilisaient. Et il était fait et soutenu par des développeurs de Google. Le développeur qui travaillait sur Arthusa en est devenu expert et pouvait être très efficace et très vite à produire un outil très complexe avec beaucoup de fonctionnalités. Et je suis sûre que nous, nous, pas, que nous ne l'avions pas utilisé. Arthusa ne serait pas aussi utile et complet. Il marche encore et beaucoup de gens en ont déjà profité pour leur enseignement et recherche. En ce sens, il était un grand succès, mais il est un très grand échec en même temps. Parce que j'ai voulu faire un outil auquel les autres développeurs peuvent ajouter des fonctionnalités. Beaucoup de l'architecture d'Arthusa était concentrée sur cet espoir. Et pour ça, le choix de Angular et la manière dont nous l'avons utilisé était un désastre. Presque immédiatement après, une nouvelle version d'Angular remplaçait la version que nous avons utilisée. Beaucoup des librairies que nous profitons aussi étaient déjà remplacées. La fréquence des changements dans le monde, monde commercial est beaucoup plus élevée que le monde développement académique. Nous avons ici trop peu de développeurs et trop peu de fans pour être toujours au courant. Et le code d'Arthusa ne peut vraiment pas être compris ou modifié sans avoir une très grande expertise avec Angular, et en particulier la version 1. Donc, nous avons maintenant un outil qui reste très utile, très important pour les utilisateurs, mais qui demande un trop grand investissement pour profiter de l'architecture et pour continuer de, de le développer. Ça ne veut pas dire qu'on ne doit jamais utiliser les frameworks comme Angular. Ils offrent suivant beaucoup d'avantages et sans les utiliser, on se risque à réinventer la roue. Mais il faut le faire avec attention et intention. Et il faut être conscient des coûts autant que des bénéfices. Beaucoup de l'effort investi en Arthusa était pour qu'il puisse être un outil de la communauté, qu'il puisse être partagé et élargi. Cet effort était pour sa majorité en vain malgré le fait qu'il a une bonne architecture en ce sens. Discutons-nous discutons, <rire> discutons un peu des autres bonnes pratiques. Ce ne sont pas toujours les pratiques techniques. Je ne prétends pas que c'est une liste complète de toutes les bonnes pratiques pour développer des, log des logiciels, simplement quelques-uns des, des plus importants à mon avis. Écrivez toujours des tests unitaires de, et d'intégration. Utilisez des services d'intégration continue comme Travis pour les exécuter automatiquement avec chaque changement et des services comme Coveralls pour vérifier que les tests sont suffisants. Écrivez la documentation dans le code. Utilisez des normes et des utiles pour la génération automatique de la documentation pour la langue dans laquelle vous écrivez. Mais faites attention au contenu. Vous voulez que votre commentaire dans le code puisse expliquer pourquoi vous avez fait quelque chose, pas seulement les choses que vous avez fait. Utilisez un linter pour imposer un style d'écriture de code et attraper les petites fautes. Utilisez un utile gestion de configuration pour déployer le logiciel. Puppet est un exemple. Faites-vous un container comme Docker si vous pouvez, mais n'ignorez pas le besoin de gérer le déploiement des conteneurs aussi. Faites attention aux dépendances sur les services externalisés et données liées. Êtes-tu sûr qu'ils ont des caractéristiques configurables qui doivent être déclarées pour déployer le logiciel et les identifier dans l'interface pour être transparent et donner du crédit à leur créateur? Utilisez les versions explicites des librairies. Si possible, gardez copies de toutes vos dépendances en cas où elles ne sont plus distribuées ou soutenues. Évaluez les politiques de soutenance et de la disponibilité sur le long terme des services et données avant de les utiliser. Pensez à créditer tous les participants et fournisseurs de code, données, temps, expertise. Avez-vous une ORC ID 
Sinon, vous devez, il est un identifier persistant pour les chercheurs. Il y a des normes comme Tadira qu'on peut utiliser. Il y a même une traduction française de Tadira, en fait, que Thibault m'a rappelé. Si vous créez des services dans lesquels les utilisateurs créent des données, ne faites pas une black box. Permettez à vos utilisateurs de prendre leurs données facilement à tout moment. Encore, utilisez des normes pour partager les données, par exemple Web Annotation, Bagot, etc. Faites aussi une API pour les données. Les utilisateurs peuvent être également d'autres systèmes que les gens ont développés. Et utilisez une norme comme OpenAPI pour offrir et documenter l'API. Vous avez probablement identifié un thème comme un, un thème comme une fille Lariane. C'est difficile de dire ça, Thibault. La suggestion d'utiliser toujours des normes. Cherchez, lire et les utiliser prend du temps, mais normalement, il en vaut la peine. Donc, je, 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 je voudrais expliquer un peu ce procès. Et parce qu'aucune présentation que je pourrais faire serait complète sans quelques diagrammes de Griffey, je vous donnerai une explication très rapide sur Passyids et les manières dont lesquelles nous avons essayé d'expliquer des mots pratiques. Malheureusement, je dois le faire en anglais. Il est trop complexe pour le faire en français pour moi. Donc, Passyids est um, une infrastructure pour, pour creating research data in the classics. Um, You can work on Perseids to create transcriptions, translations, and annotations of ancient texts. And it's composed of a set of core components um, which connect to another set of hosted tools and services, all by via APIs. And through that, other third-party applications and platforms can take advantage of Perseids using its APIs and links into it. Um, and in turn, it uses APIs of services such as GitHub or CTS repositories to retrieve and store data. And it uses um, standards such as the Shibboleth Identity Providers and OAuth to, to do authentication. So here you can see that already we um, take advantage of a number of norms or standards in the system for our APIs. OAuth, Shibboleth, OpenAPI, CTS, we use a collections <coughs> API that's part of the Research Data Alliance. It's, it's the fact that we are using standard APIs and have documented how to talk to the system that enables this type of interaction between a variety of different projects and libraries. So you can see like a number of, of third-party application platforms have taking advantage of Perseids through the use of the APIs. The Eagle platform, uh, there's a tool called Dolphin for analyzing uh, annotations that are created. The Syriaca.org project uses uh, components of the Perseids review workflow, same with Symmetia. Um, the Perseids infrastructure itself is pretty complex, so you can see why some of these uh, practices matter here in order to keep track of things. Um, SOSOL itself, the core of the platform, which I mentioned earlier, which was a tool that was developed for uh, working with Papyri, um, it sits at the core and manages the workflow of the users, and it uses APIs to connect to its systems. Um, you can see that there <laughs> my diagrams are always really <laughs> complex, but you can see all of the different interactions that are happening here in order to, to affect something. So, so The platform itself talks to a number of different services. It talks to a number of different annotation tools. It keeps its collections of data here. Each of these is an individual piece of software, in many cases written for something else that was repurposed. Uh, there are a number of different languages of programming languages in use here. We use the Ruby programming languages. We use um, Python. There's some XSLT and XQuery. There used to be some Java, which is now gone. Um, there's definitely a lot of JavaScript in here. There's different database systems. All of this needed to be documented. Uh, one of the last things I did on Perseids before wrapping up the project was to finish uh, a set of manifests through which the whole system can be stood up automatically. 
um, and deployed through its puppet manifest. So all of these dependencies between the different systems are managed in an automated configuration management system. Um, other, other standards that we have use here are we use OpenAPI for representing the annotations. We use the TEI standard for, for our XML. We use the CTS standard for um, identifying texts and passages of texts. And um, users can, can download data from Perseids using the Bagot. They can get a Bagot research object bundle of their data. So in, every, in each case, we try to implement standards where we could in order to make some of this more manageable. Again, this is another view of, of the, of, so that was sort of the, a, a wide view of it, but we also have, this is a look at all the different services we have, the TreeBank editor, uh, Nemo, which is a tool that Timo developed to present, um, as part of the Captain Suite to present the texts. Um, we have different tokenization services, morphology services, all of these have a, themselves a number of dependencies upon each other. So it's a highly complex set of infrastructure. And we definitely didn't follow good practices through the whole thing, but we tried <laughs> where we could. And it's you know one of the things that makes any of this manageable. We also did some work on sustainability planning. You know, these are all open services available not only to the people at Tufts for which, you know, where it was developed, but it's in use in Germany, in Croatia and Brazil, and so one of the things we did was work with Tufts to make sure that there was a sustainability plan after the funding from their, because it was a grant funded project, so Tufts has committed to, to hosting these services, and that was an important part for me to make sure that I was not just building all of these tools and making sure they were there, and having people use them and then abandoning them. So. Um, I'm not sure you have any sense of what Perseus is from these diagrams, but you definitely have a sense of its complexity. Um, and I just wanted to take a few minutes to say uh, a bit about Alpheus, the project that I'll be working on next, through which I'll be applying some of these same ideas. Alpheus is a, a set of tools for reading ancient texts in a number of different languages. We supported Greek, Latin, and Arabic to start. We'll be adding support for other languages such as Syriac, Coptic ancient <laughs> medieval French, old French. Um, you know, the, the idea is to build a set of open tools, uh, open libraries that can be combined in a number of different ways, mi mi combined together to build a single app or to be used in place in different uh, projects. Um, and so we're kind of at the, at the reinventing of the wheel stage right now of Alpheus in that we're starting with a blank page but with an idea of what we want to do and all of this, um, experience in the digital humanities behind us now to think about how we can interact with researchers like yourselves in, in a number of different universities to make the tools more useful and more collaboratively sustained. Donc, uh, voilà. <laughs> J'ai essayé de vous donner quelques exemples qui viennent de ma propre expérience avec le développement pour les humanités numériques. C'était une tâche un peu formidable de le faire en français. <laughs> J'espère que j'ai dit au moins, au moins une ou deux choses qui, de choses qui aient du sens. Je suis vraiment un peu éblouie par leur effort. Je vous jure que je ne vais jamais plus assister à une conférence où les présentations doivent être en anglais sans y penser. <laughs> je serais serai ravie de répondre à n'importe quelle question en anglais, je pense. Et, et je vais vous aussi donner quelques références et li liens que j'espère je, peuvent être utiles. Merci. Je vais reprendre en anglais, probablement. Euh, quand on développe un projet très spécifique euh, avec euh, des données très particulières, hein, donc euh, non reproductives ou en tout cas qui concernent qu'un projet de recherche, et qu'on cherche à donner des identifiants pérennes, euh, quelle serait la meilleure méthode par qui euh, passer en fait, dans ce cas 
So to find identifiers for your texts, is that the question? The best no, for when, when, you, when working when, with when you're really specific data um, that you can't introduce um, through any kind of, of saying, right? It's just data that are really specific to your project. Yeah. And you want persistent identifier. identifier. What do you do? Hmm. It's a very good question. And it's one um, that I think we all spend too much time on without coming to a really good solution. I recommend looking at using the handle system. You can get so you can maybe you can get DOIs through the through through GitHub, or you can speak to your um, your university about registering handles. So handles are the are the identifiers that that sit behind, it's the architecture that sits behind DOIs. Um, a lot of the work that I one of the things that I worked on through the last years at Tufts was to participate in the Research Data Alliance, which is an organization which is working on um, building infrastructure for interoperability of in, in data. And we've talked a lot about the need for persistent identifiers, not only for publications, but the individual data items. And th this, the, the use of the handle system, I think, is the way most people in the sciences are going right now with registering large groups of handles for their data objects and then uh, apply and using those. So um, your library ought to know about handles and, and ought to be able to help you work with that. That would be my advice. I check with them. Did they, and they don't know about them? <laughs> or you will check with them, <laughs> okay. of the code is a, a very important question. And uh, as example, at the Ecole des Chartes, we have uh, software and tools built with uh, old PHP uh, code or a lot of different things which are really uh, duplicated now. Uh, what would be a good, uh, what is the durability time for, for code or software? Because you, you told us that you used to have some Java code mm -hmm. that you don't. Probably it's now it's Python. Or yeah, I or replaced it with Python. I think one of the main problems, because we are in, in a long ter term work, uh, long term uh, work. It's not uh, mm -hmm. detizing or industry, as, as you said. We need to, to keep the, the software for a long time. And 10 years, for example, is quite a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's why it gets back to those questions that you need to ask at the start. What, what is it that you actually need to preserve? Did the software influence your results? Did it influence your data? In that case, you, may, you need to maybe invest the time in making sure it can be packed in a container like Docker or something like that and re-executed. If the software itself was not, to, was not critical to the research outcome, but maybe was just part of your process, you could consider doing things like there's a web IO, which is a tool for recording interactions on the web in a web archive that then can be stored. So that, that's one option too, is to record user, to record the tool in action, but not the code, not ensure that the code itself needs to be re-executed. Re so it, it, I think each, there's no one single answer to that because yeah. it depends. And if, 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 for example, you cited your, if you cited your software in papers, right, you said, and pointed to it in a link, somewhere you deployed it on a site, then you may want to consider making sure that link at least points at something, snapshots of the tool or a code repository or something. You know, so there's like the ideal, which is that every piece of software we ever wrote would be preserved forever, re-executable. It's not, I mean, nobody has the money or the time to do that, but to, to spend some time thinking about what is the purpose of preserving it? And who who needs the the outcomes of that will help identify then the help you drive you towards an answer that makes sense for that particular piece of code. And it's a good way to think how to uh, build some good pieces of uh, software. I mean, 
Par exemple, so, uh, text processing is a long-term uh, service, long-term need. Yeah. And maybe you need to implement this very specific question in XSLT because you know that you will be able to process the, the data in the name XSLT for a long time. Mm -hmm. But for the web service, for example, in the break of the code, it's something you can throw right. away five years ago. And I think that your diagram, very complex, is a good way to understand yeah. that. that. There is a lot of different bricks and uh, some of them are not long-term bricks. Right? Right. <coughs> yes, but yes. And you it have to know which ones are. Yeah. yeah. So it, it and it and it changes throughout. You may think a piece of software is not going to be critical, yeah. and it turns out to be a central part of your workflow. <laughs> and so then you need to go back and rethink it. So these things should always be in your head. I think, and I think some of the points at which to make those decisions are the points at which you see. You're publishing an article about your research. Well, that's the point to say, you know, am I, if I, am I citing something here? Then it needs to exist. Um, it, it happens sometimes in my, I'd say, most of the times that we have money for a project for, I'd say, five years, for instance. And then we don't have money anymore, and we don't know who's going to maintain the code. And do we think that should be a reason to stop developing new stuff because it's a kind of waste of time? Or do you think we should just try to <coughs> get new position for people that could just maintain the code in an institutional um, <laughs> It's a really, really yeah. difficult question. I mean, it's one reason why I think Reuse of code is important, right? Because more, the more people reuse code, the more that code can be sustained, right? So when I used papyri.info, it enabled me to get funding for a project by the original funders of that project, right? And it enabled their, it increased their commitment to that code base. And it increased the developers of the original code base's commitment to it because they suddenly had a new set of users. And so, and also, it meant that there was one less thing that I was writing that was duplicative. So that was a cons conservation effort, in a sense. Um, but you, there is always, there, of course, reason to write new code. And if everything that we needed existed, <laughs> then we would all be doing something else, right? So we do need to write new code. And I don't think the fact that you only have five years of funding means you shouldn't do it. But it, it means that you should think from the beginning about you know, when you're done with your funding, what are you going to do? Talk with the library, for example. This is a role I think the libraries are starting to realize that they can and should play, is what looks like the output, output of research is no longer just books and papers, it's software. And so the libraries and, and our, our institutional repositories are going to need to begin to provide solutions for that. Um, there are also you know, repositories in the humanities that are shared service repositories, like you have here in, in France, Humanum, you know, and those are places that you can look to maybe for long-term sustainability too. If you build something that other people might want to use, and I know like we've talked about using the capi, putting, having Humanum support capitans and that sort of thing. So, so I think that there are, I think it, it requires creative thinking and to begin to think as a community together about these are, these are, these are outputs of research that we want to collectively sustain one way or another. not the code itself, yeah. and um, you see how a library is over within the month or two months, there is a new version, etc. So we don't really know what's going to happen with the project. We know what's going to happen with the data, I mean, it's supposed to be safe, yeah. but what if in five years this version of PHP, for, uh, PHP, for instance, mm -hmm. doesn't work anymore? And this could be a big... Um, Limitation for creating new projects. Yep. And and I think if you if you think if you think about that as you develop, if you think about you know if you as the developer, the bus factory, if you got run over by a bus tomorrow today, who would pick up your code tomorrow, right? So if you think about that as you go and say, okay, each time I build a new version or do something important, I'm going to build a container, a Docker container, or a freeze an image of the code at this point. You know, those are some steps you can take along the way that ultimately help with, with preservation of the code and will help your project as you go. Um, 
So I don't think we should give up on the idea just because, and, and I think it's something that we need, as researchers and developers need to push our institutions and our libraries to support. You know, we had to push Tufts hard to support Perseids and to hire a developer to contain it, maintain it for the long term. And so it's, it's you know, but the institutions can respond if they understand this is the needs of the community. So I think, you know, maybe that's a little ideal, but it's, 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 it's awareness, you know. So at the start of your talk, you made a, a very important point about the, the fact that we were uh, into coding the humanities because it will allow us to uh, uh, build new knowledge about our, uh, our domain. Um, if I understood uh, well, you would make a difference in terms of preservation between the fact of um, preserving algorithms that were used in uh, obtaining scientific results mm -hmm. and performing analysis and code that was here as interface to right. allow browsing the data and so on. Exactly. And sometimes sometimes it's the same, right? If like that's what I say, if, there, if you do a visualization that re represents your data in a certain way, that's part of your argument, right? If you couldn't present that visual if you couldn't make your argument without that specific visualization, then that that software is important to be able to reproduce the visualization or at least to be able to capture the output of the visualization. But if it's if it's you know simply just to, to to display HTML you know in a pretty way with C you know that sort of thing is maybe not as important to preserve, but certainly anything that that influenced your research results, whatever those might be, I think is important to think about. And um, to follow on that, is, is the exact form of the algorithm that was used important? For instance, that language, that version, and so on, or do you think maybe at some point porting it to another language, but with the same algorithm behind, um, does it count as a form of, of preservation or is there may, maybe too much risk that behaves differently? Well, it's a, I think you, do sh you should record what you, you, the exact version language that you used, in, and there are like Pravo and other languages to, 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 to represent this information explicitly. I do think you should store that with the data. If you can't preserve it, at least you have the knowledge of what was used. Um, because it's true that different implementations of an algorithm can produce different results. <coughs> it's, it's really just the same point, but uh, to some extent, the imagination of the developer um, determines how wide a constituency he can address. And obviously, if you want it to survive, you have to make it as useful as possible to as many people as possible. And this can be done to various varying degrees. And again, it depends on the developer, unfortunately. You know, they, you know, but it's, it's something that can be done to a good way to be Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that you, I think you, you skipped uh, in your presentation was the question of, of microservices that offers um, standards. Mm -hmm. So basically, chunking down the, your whole project into super small chunks. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate about that? And probably because I know the history behind, but uh, maybe taking on the history of Perseus, I think, might be. Uh, so the rationale for microservices? Yeah, the rationale for the microservices on the long term. Most likely. Yeah. And explaining what is microservices, because like, I'm not sure that everyone. So, I mean, I think there are different definitions for microservices. In, in this context, I think it's thinking about, um, so for example, just to talk about a specific example, the process of getting a text for annotation. You have Caesar's Gallic Wars in TEI XML presented by Perseus. Uh, and you want to annotate that and create a tree bank from it, which means you need it in a completely different format. You need... Um, the words to be tokenized into individual words, you need the sentences, seg you need the text segmented into sentences, and you need it in a different XML format, which is the XML format of the tree bank. And so to get from that spot, we have a number of different services. Thilo knows this well because he wrote this code. <laughs> but you, know, you, you have a service which retrieves the text from one place, and you have another service which does the process of tokenization of identifying the individual sentences and the individual words, and yet a third service that you use to do the transformation. And then, um, and so each of those steps along the way can be thought of as an individual microservice. And the reason it's important 
to, to separate those rather than just have one big, you know, black box button, you say press this and it, and it works, and it's all combined, is that um, one, you might want to use these services in different ways, um, or the, the functionality may change, the code around it may change, the, that may become deprecated, and then in order to reproduce the functionality, you need to reproduce the whole thing. But if we have a separate morphological service and a separate tokenization service and a separate service that, that's serving the text and retrieval, then, then, then one, it becomes less, it becomes less brittle because if one piece needs augmenting or changing, you can change that without affecting the others. Um, but also, uh, and now what I was gonna say about that just flew out of my head, but um, it, it just, it, it, it becomes also more open, right? So that if, right, if you look at Perseus, the old Perseus system, the only texts that are available for reading in Perseus, for accessing all of those tools in Perseus, are the ones that are loaded in the Perseus database. And in order to do any of that analysis, so when you when you look at a text in Perseus, it has been already, at the time it was loaded, it was tokenized and identified which lemma, which dictionary entry, all of that stuff was done at the time it was added to the system and fixed with it in the system. So that means the, the effort needed to get a new text to have all that services and all that information available for a new text is very big. But if you've opened your, if you've built a system that uses APIs to talk to it, its individual components, then you open yourself up for contributions from other systems. So if, you know, another publisher of ancient text all of a sudden wanted to make its text, have, have some of these tools available, we could have retrieved from, from those repositories as well. Since we had an API for talking to a text service, they would just have to, to, to build maybe a small API onto their service and then it would be able to interoperate. So that's, I think, a big motivation for microservices is to enable interoperability in ways that you maybe hadn't considered. There, does that answer, does that? I, I think mostly, yes. Essentially where you wanted me to go with that. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to just thinking more about the identifier question because it's a really good question and it's it's something that that affects a lot of projects. If you, if you want to stay after, there's a I, I was involved in a project called RPID, which is providing a test bed for people to to be able to create to to request identifiers for individual data objects and participate in a data in a <laughs> workflow. And it's a, it's a U.S. project, but it's open to people, researchers from around the world, and they would really like humanities um, use cases. So I can put the I can actually put a put the um, put a link to it up here, and and if you if you want, you, I think you can also contact me after. But but I, it, it's exactly trying to address this issue that researchers have workflows in which they need persistent identifiers for data, and to provide some services for doing that because. The, the libraries, although they know what handles are and they know how to, to produce them for publications, they're not in the point yet a lot of where they can produce them for individual data objects. <laughs> so the name of the project is Carpet. And um, I think if you go to GitHub, And I can uh, give you a link to it later, too. Those are good questions. Um, for me personally, making sure I'm writing all the unit tests and integration tests for what I'm doing is one of the ch most challenging things. And um, it may be from my own background where I came into programming as a tester, a, a user tester of the code, and so I'm very comfortable with testing the code myself as a 
you know, in the interface or whatever. But I, I did not learn to program with the practice of writing tests as I code. And it's when I can get into it and spend the time on it, I think it's the, the best way to program it, especially if you write your tests before you even write your code, because then you think about what you want to do. But it's very challenging, and it's very easy to slip. Right? It's really easy to say, oh, I don't need to write a test for that. Or it's very difficult, too, to identify the individual unit tests that you need to write and not think about it from like the, the whole perspective. Um, but, I, but I do think it's one of the most worthwhile things to do because in the process of writing those tests, you're going to see how you've t t how places where you've made your code too complex or too tightly coupled or where you can't, for example, when you, when you write a code, when you have code that depends on a service, for example, if you try to write a unit test for that, if you don't have the service available, you can't, you can't execute the code, so then you need to write a mock, and then you begin to see where you've made assumptions in your code about how, how the service is going to be made available. So, so I think it's the most challenging and, but, and one of the most important. And the second part of your question... As, as a reuser of software oh. developed by others, what do you think is the best practice that is the... It's well, so, so tests too, right? Because if you, as a reuser, you don't know if you've broken something. If, and if there's, if there's unit tests for everything, if you've touched some part of the code, like th that's the thing with Son of Suda Online, where there were not a lot of unit tests written when I first started reusing it. And I added a lot because I didn't want to break the functionality. Um, but you, so, so having, having unit tests, I think, is really important because as a reuser, you want to make sure to only change the things that you need and not break the existing things. Documentation is important, but most documentation is not very good. So I, I don't want to put too much emphasis on it because a lot of people document, you know, they might document their method calls or what the t method does, but they don't document necessarily why they've made a particular choice. And that, when you're trying to understand somebody else's code, that why is really important. The, the things like the method calls and all that stuff, which looks really nice in printed documentation, doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, not printed, but you know what I mean, in the, in the documentation browsers, it doesn't really tell you much more than you could tell from reading the code yourself. And to reuse code, you have to read it. You, you have to be willing to, to put your head into somebody else's code and understand it. And so if they've made really convoluted choices, like some of the choices that we made in Arethusa were really convoluted, if you can't see into the developer's thought pattern, then you can't reuse it. So documentation is important, but code commentary, not the you know the the just the standard documentation. So I think a combination of those two things, unit tests and documentation, are most important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
lot about the history of art and tools. But as Thibault reminds me, there is a standard called IIIF, which is an image interoperability framework for representing both, it provides a, a, a method for identifying your images as well as for an, identifying annotations and images. There are a number of, of really lovely tools for working with images that in IIIF. Um, Mirador is one of them. Um, and a number of, bibli of art bibliotheques, a number of museums, libraries, that sort of thing, are now beginning to make their images available under this standard, which means that um, anybody can, can access them and pull them into a new tool of their own. Um, and it, it works under the idea of canvases, so you might build a canvas of multiple images. And then you can publish your canvas for other people to use, and you can do annotations on the canvas. And there are new developments in that around um, text as well. So that's, th that's the one I know most uh, related to art. Um, I, I'm not that familiar with other activities in that area, though, unfortunately. Um, to, to add on, on, on what you say, actually, uh, that's the field right now, I think, which is the strongest in terms of, of <coughs> interoperability. Um, because, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's really complex to share text, actually. It, it doesn't look like complex. Uh, like you have XML, you have uh, plain text, you have Markdown, you have HTML, you have, you have a lot of format for text. Word, PDF, there is so many format for text. But images are actually quite simple with, with a lot of, of uh, you know, uh, gimme. <laughs> um, and um, IIIF, I think, is, is exactly <coughs> like the thing that everybody is looking for right now. Uh, all around the world, it's a project that is what three, four years old. Mo oh, it's maximum? more than that. It's it's because it started off as something called shared canvas, which was you know almost seven years ago now, probably or eight. But triple A is it is three young, if I remember correctly. It's it's been you know the last four or five years, I think. Now. Okay, okay, but four or five years. Yeah. But but it has an adoption rate that yeah. is enormous. Um, you have Bibisima that is using here using it. Gallica is completely based, based on, on, on AAA. Um, and you have museums all around, all around the world that is, who, who are using uh, AAA. And I think that's, that's also, uh, that's why it's one of the strongest standards yeah. uh, right now. And that's why it's important to use a standard, right? Because it's not that it's necessarily the best standard ever developed for images, but, but people started using it. And the more people that used it, the more people built tools for it, right? So then the more tools there are for it, the more reason there is to use it. So, you know, it doesn't mean you should use whatever standard out there if it doesn't apply to you, but it is really worth it to, to take the time to investigate a standard because it, it both strengthens the standard and it strengthens your work and, and the work of others. Um, but yeah, it's... it's I. I don't think anybody doing anything with images and digital humanities isn't doing something with IIIF right now, except for maybe one project.